Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the ThoughtWorks Technology Podcast. I'm one of your regular hosts, Ashok Subramanian, and I'm joined today by another one of our regular hosts, Ken. Hi, I'm Ken McGrage. Nice to speak to you again. Today, we are joined by uh, two, two guests who are experts in a topic that is probably becoming quite relevant to all of us uh, today. So I'll let our guests uh, introduce themselves first. Uh, Sriram, do you want to start off? Thanks, Ashok and Ken. It's good to be on this podcast. My name is Sriram. I'm from Bangalore. and I'm a business leader for software-defined vehicle topics in ThoughtWorks. Uh, and Michael? Hello, everyone. My name is Michael. I'm a developer. Um, clearly, my background is in the web and the cloud world. Um, but the last years, I've been working only for automotive and in embedded automotive development. I do everything STV in ThoughtWorks. So as our guest sort of almost gave away what this episode is going to be all about. It's all about software-defined vehicles. Uh, so I think to get us maybe started off, like software and automotive, it almost seems like, you know, you're going back a few years, you wouldn't have put the, the two of them in the same sentence. Uh, and yet I think here we are today almost like, you know, talking of vehicles that are being defined by software. Uh, so perhaps we can maybe start off by why is software like becoming so key in the, in the space? Sure. Uh, I've been reflecting on this question for a long time now. Uh, and when I think of it, uh, the demography or the characteristics of the population who are buying a vehicle or a car today are those of digital natives. So therefore, the expectations uh, from a car buyer is extremely different these days. Uh, and to deliver to that experience, I guess software is going to be a very uh, integral element and therefore I, it's very clear that the entire talking point uh, about automotive is software these days. Michael, you had you, you had a perspective as well. You want to sort of share that? Yeah, I mean, if, if we think about um, what features can we add to, to cars and um, how, how these are involving, I think there are two aspects inside a, a passenger car um, that where where great innovation is happening and, and the evolution is happening and that's who won the infotainment, you know, the big screen in the middle and maybe the instrument cluster and other screens. Um, and the second one is uh, ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems or Autonomous Driving. And both of these obviously rely on certain capabilities of the hardware, but the differentiator, the functionality comes from the software. And I guess you could argue, well, cars didn't run without software for, for, for two decades, right? But we come to the point where it becomes the key differentiating factor for the user experience. Yeah, I think you can't really, uh, nowadays you can't almost think of doing anything without your phone uh, and sort of almost like natural extension of that, sort of taking that almost everywhere in there, uh, definitely. So is uh, like SDV seems to be, you know, there's there's a lot of talk about SDV. So is there, is there you know, when... When you are like talking to clients, and you know, as you're sort of developing our own uh, uh, or thinking in the space, are there other things that are like I've heard of things like case? Like, how does that actually fit in? And maybe a bit of if you could give our audience a bit of the the history of how this thing has actually evolved to what we are calling as DV today. I, th I think case stands for connected autonomous shared and electric and at, at least i came across this this acronym first let's say 2018 so five about five years ago and to me software defined vehicle and case are somewhat like two different perspectives on on, on a very similar thing one describes more how the physical product of a car is evolving. It becomes connected and connected to digital services. It becomes autonomous, it becomes electric and so on. Um, and also what we see, the, the shared aspect of it, I mean, we have more and more services where you can basically buy mobility rather than buying the physical product. So case to me is more about the product, the car, and software-defined vehicle, from my, uh, from my perspective, is more about um, how is this implemented? And this is obviously implemented by physical components, um, but much, much more also right now because of the software that is running on this. Shuram, would you agree? Uh, absolutely. I can only think of an analogy, right? So many times uh, these days, cars are compared with phones very loosely, 
But just to explain case, I think when there was this Nokia phones or the Blackberry phones and then there came touch screens, right? So that was an evolution. So I would see a, a car, let's say a connected car is an evolution of a car. Uh, of course, electric is a very clearly a different part train. Uh, and autonomous is a very different way of driving your vehicle. And a shared uh, mobility is to bring in new business models uh, to the ecosystem. Uh, but the common denominator across all of these evolutions is software, right? And I think that's where I, uh, I feel today there's a lot of talk about software-defined vehicles. Maybe to add to that, because you mentioned, you know, often we hear this analogy, the smartphone on wheels. And I think there are many aspects why I don't like this analogy. But it, but I think if we think about right now, software becomes the differentiating factor for the functionality of a car because of infotainment and others AD systems. But I guess it won't be very long where you set the expectations. And that is similar to a smartphone. I buy a car and over the next two, three, four, five years, it gets updates and it adds to the functionality. Same you have with your phone. Um, and I think there the analogy of smartphone is good. And I guess we will also come to the point where a car is more about, think about you buy a thousand euro PC from the electronic store right now. It's a box, it has some hardware, but within hours you can install software and you can make it a workstation, you can make it a gaming PC, you can make it, uh, I don't know, a media server. So the software defines how you can use it. And I think the more we move away from this privately owned physical product car towards their just devices for, for mobility, um, the more we will see aspects of those. Through the software, you define how the car can fit into a larger system. So that actually opens up a question I'd like to ask is, where does um, you know security and those types of things live in this world? Uh, you talk about things updating themselves and so forth. Um, you know, my computer actually updated right before this recording. I'm like, come on, finish in time for, you know, for the meeting. Um, you know, if that happened while I, into my car while I was merging on the highway, that would have been very bad. Um, and so how do we balance this, turn your thing into whatever it is you want and security with this ability? I read this this book called the, the uh, Car Hacker's Guide Handbook or something like this. And it begins with, a, with the attack vectors of a, of a modern car. And I looked at my 12-year-old Volkswagen and no, it doesn't have this one, it doesn't have this one, it doesn't have this one. So yes, over the time, obviously, the um, the potential attack factors of a car, they increase. And I, I don't think it's that much different to connected devices. We we got from, you know, from 2016 onwards with, with the IoT world. Um, you have to think really hard about the threat modeling and about... What are the things you want to avoid? Because I think what becomes clear, if I have a physical access to a car and a screwdriver and time, likely I can't do much to make it 100% secure. When it comes to, I can directly connect to a car through the Wi-Fi, Bluetooth or whatever, and can do stuff without even having physical access to it. This is something we clearly need to avoid. But I think the worst case scenario is somebody takes the firmware update server over and has a malicious uh, software update for all of the cars that are out there. That's that's like the worst case. And I guess very similar to, to systems where we have connected devices, we need to have those different scenarios and then put measurement into that. And to be very honest, I think that we can we need to adapt lots of practices we find in other domains to this one. But I fully agree with you. I, I don't want to be on the Autobahn and then have a software update. But um, th that's the easier thing to, to solve, I would say. <laughs> think about, like, like clearly, uh, like we think about in, uh, when we think about, like, manufacturing, there are, like, many, many different players involved. And the, and the whole automotive landscape is, like, filled with, like, you know, obviously you've got the, the main manufacturer, the brand, but, like, this big supply chain and many other uh, people who are sort of contributing to that. Uh, so when I'm thinking of like software in this space, it almost is this, I suppose, a collection of many different bits, just similar to the hardware that's being put together. Is that is that true? Do you, I mean, is that how you sort of view this world as well? Like you've got different pieces of components by different people sort of having to come together. 
I would definitely think so. Um, and just because you're talking about software and automotive, it's not that software did not exist in automotive even before, let's say, Michael heard about case in 2018. Software always existed in cars. There are, let's say, even in today's car, uh, there are about 100 plus ECUs, which means there are about 100 million lines of code written. Right. And even in today's world, this software comes from different players. Right. Uh, and this is not going to change, but just the fact that who's going to bring in this software in tomorrow's car will probably change. Right. There were probably predefined roles in how OEMs did some part of the work, how tire ones been brought in some part of work. Today, hyperscalers can bring in that uh, little bit uh, different kind of a work. So, the, the ability to bring software into a car uh, basically is going to be different from different set of stakeholders and very clearly the number of lines of code uh, is just going to uh, exponentially increase. So I think the world is not going to be different, just that the role uh, and the kind of uh, you know software that different players in this ecosystem bring into the vehicle uh, and at different layers of the tech stack, this is definitely going to change. So a car, a modern luxury passenger car has about 100 electrical computing units, ECUs. So computers, some of them are very, very small microcontrollers. Some of them are almost full-blown PCs. Um, so if you think about, you have a hundred different uh, computing units that have to collaborate together. This is a very complex systems. Uh, system. And obviously there are things, you know, where, where you divide then the complexity. Um, but I think what is changing now also in, in the era of SDV is, is the architecture. So it tends that there will be fewer, even more powerful computers um, that run a lot of the logic and there will be smaller units that are very tight and close to the hardware as in, I need this piece of software for the airbag. And when I change the airbag, I need to change this. But also then you have this abstraction of Oh, this is taking care of of this uh, the emergency braking as an ADAS function, uh, and this might then be abstracted. And right now, people think really hard and design upfront how all this collaborates together. And I guess what a lot of people are aiming for right now is to have this hardware abstraction layer in between, so that you can lose uh, use business logic on on different variants of hardware. Does that make sense? Who owns the customer experience in this in this world? That's a fantastic question. All that and done, I think, uh, at least in my personal view, and that's where the, you know, the interesting game is. Uh, and I think in my view, it's definitely the OEMs or the manufacturers, because ultimately people buy cars for a brand, for a, for a logo, for their convenience. So ultimately, they are responsible, in my view, for the consumer experience. Yes. And I think the customer experience is defined besides the, the physical product of the car and how it sounds and how it behaves on, on a physical layer by the screens you see and by the functionality, especially in the artist area. And these are the two things. And, and what I find interesting that some of the OEMs want to keep those things really, really close to the heart because that's where the innovation is happening. But at the same time, these systems are very, very complex and just very expensive to develop. So what you see also is that um, some of the OEMs are moving more and more to things like Android Automotive, which is basically then an Android system running in infotainment. Uh, because I mean, think about all the features there. It's it's just a lot of code. And what we also see on on the the other big part of this and 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 the ADAS and AD systems that you have specialized companies like, for example, Mobile Eye that or Nvidia, right? That provide then the sensor kit and the hardware. Uh, the computing hardware and the software for it. So I, I think as an OEM, you should keep those things very close to you because that's the differentiating factor. But at the same time, you also have to make a business decision. You you can't write every single line of code yourself. That's not possible anymore. Clearly, a lot of new hardware is also being developed at the same time. At the same time, you also have to like, you know, develop software on top of that. Uh, so a while back, you mentioned this this concept of layer of hardware abstraction on top. So, uh, is is there something you can uh, like, you know, give a bit more sort of example on of what that might actually mean? So, does it mean you can swap a like, you know, you have a piece of unit goes def defective and you can sort of swap that out and you still everything else in the system still works, or what was the you know 
what did you mean by when you said hardware abstraction there? First of all, it's splitting the software into the pieces of the software that are hardware bound, meaning different hardware would require different different things there. So very close to the actuators and sensors of the car. Um, and then you have the more functional and business logic on top. Um, so that's a cut you, you probably would like to have, which is, to be honest, not given in a lot of places that you basically write the features again and again with every new hardware that's coming, like all the way. Um, but it's also about the level of abstraction you have in the interfaces. Right now, it's not uncommon that you plan the communication on a, on a very low technical level. This integer is sent from this ECU to this ECU, and it means that's the velocity or, or, or whatever, right? Um, and when you think about a hardware abstraction layer, you want to move away from this very, very specific integer to more uh, domain specific interfaces. In some cases, uh, the way you're sort of describing some of the domain interfaces, uh, given the ultimate experience that you want, might be something that the OEM actually ends up defining so that they can work with multiple different supplies in that case. Okay. Yeah. Now, clearly, I think, uh, Sriram, you had mentioned, you know, software isn't new in this space, but clearly, I think software wasn't really moving at the pace at which we're sort of seeing it or even like, customer sort of expected, right? You sort of expect your phone to, uh, or apps to sort of update on a fairly regular basis. Uh, and, you know, given the manufacturing industry or background, a lot of the car manufacturing sort of ethos needs to come from, what's the, what's the shift or what, you know, what are the things do you think the, uh, the auto industry can learn from you know, other industries that have like adopted software or software engineering practice a lot earlier? I think in my view, automotive industry in its tipping point that way, I think automotive industry has always been learning from, you know, the other technology spaces to make the experience in a car uh, better uh, and also to make mobility safer uh, and efficient, right? So from an engineering point of view, this evolution has always been there. But in the recent past, and of course in the future, if I can think of three things, uh, you know, I was thinking of A, B, C, D, but I could only think of A, C, and D. Uh, a is, you know, uh, in a sense, the architecture, right? A lot of emphasis is made on the ENE, the electrical and electronics architecture in a car. Uh, this is fundamentally improved a lot, uh, right? And this is creating a lot of efficiencies and a better way of writing software and therefore delivering uh, value. The other two aspects is the play with cloud and data, right? Uh, 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 let's say the electronic control unit are always just seen as an embedded device. Today, these devices are becoming edge devices and uh, they're easily interfaceable uh, to the cloud. Uh, and today's cars produce so much data, right? And with the ability to use this data effectively, um, I think the value that we're able to deliver in mobility is improve. And I think these are three areas which very clearly uh, the automotive industry uh, has, uh, has stood to gain uh, from the technology industry. I mean, what we have to understand is 20 years ago, the software for the car was not the significant cost factor when you develop the car. Um, if that's a very, very small portion, um, having profound capabilities and also capacity in software development is not nearly as important as it is today. Um, and therefore also the, <clears throat> the ways of working and the practices have been optimized to make the start of production when the factory is ready, the software needs to be ready, um, make it as efficient as possible. Software was almost treated like a small hardware component. Um, and now this complexity is much bigger. So this already doesn't work that well anymore. But also what we have to understand is in, in the era of SDV, the software for a car is never done. Just because we have the start of production doesn't mean we stop developing for this now. And this massively has um, impacts also the, the processes uh, within the OEMs and the tier ones, but also the, the collaboration with the partners. Um, before that, you can write a spec. You implement it, you test it, 
And if this is a very waterfallish um, long-term thing, that's okay as long as the quality is good at the end. And now you have to think about how can I do this in a much more iterative way? Um, and I think this is, I mean, one of the things that we know from the web and cloud world, the, the saying is that if it hurts, do it more often, right? And the more often you do things in smaller chunks, the better you get at it. And I guess that's one of the paradigms that need to be adopted in a certain way when we are developing software for cars. I think the link you drew over there, uh, it just definitely resonated quite a bit. Like, you know, the, you can't really think of it as a, you know, as a journey with an end, uh, you know, with a defined sort of, you know, start and stop, right? You, you, it's the expectation is you have to continue to sort of evolve it. And then you almost have like the car as a platform where you're ready to sort of accept updates of software that need to be continuously sort of delivered. So, uh, the the shift in mindset of something of you know okay you manufacture the car but actually that's not the in some ways that's not just the end product and the end product can continue to sort of evolve and that shift in mindset so one thing to add there because um there are other industries where you have heavy reg regulations and and compliance requirements as well but in the automotive industry that's also given and if you now um design a software develop a software test it then you basically also do the audit that it's allowed to drive on on the public road um, in the world of a software defined vehicle where you say want to update the software for certain parts of, of the car every month you also need to find more iterative and other ways how you fulfill the re compliance requirements and also how you do the audit process and, and i think one thing um we can we can also see in, in other industries and in other parts is keep all the information that you need for this as close to the code as possible. In a lot of other industries, we're speaking about architecture as code, because if the architecture is also defined within your code base and you have a pipeline that produces the diagrams for this, uh, there's a much better chance that it's congruent with, with um, the code. And the same thing goes then for the, for the requirements, for the functional safety, protocols and documentation. And I guess that's not one thing we just came up with ThoughtWorks, but this is also something we see in the industry right now happening that people try to move away from SharePoint folders and Word documents to acts as code. Which kind of brings me a loop back to, we, we talked about customer experience a little while ago. Um, I'm not going to throw the manufacturer under the bus, but my partner and I both have vehicles from the same manufacturer and they did a software update that alerts us if there's an emergency vehicle ahead which sounds like a great thing, right? We, hey, there's a, there's a collision ahead. There's an ambulance on the side of the road. Be careful. Um, but in truth, it, it has tons of false alarms. Um, and so I'm sure it worked well in their controlled environment, but they really, they had to pull it back about a month after launching it because people were constantly being more distracted. Um, and so, you know, we would talk about customer experience like up front and that, okay, the OEM owns that, but how do you manage that over the life of a vehicle? You know, I mean, we keep ours for six to eight years. Um, so how do you how do you recommend to like our clients or manufacturers that they take that into account as these systems are evolving? One aspect is a lot about shifting as many things left as possible. Um, shifting left in the sense of do the testing, the verification as early in the in 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 the process as possible, in the sense of testing software with cars, with physical cars, is slow and expensive. Testing testing functionalities in the wild on public streets is even more expensive to that. And what we see is that um, people put a lot of effort now in to simulate things as much as possible in a virtual environment. And I think this reminds me a lot of what we see in, in, in software development as, as a test pyramid, where you want to do lots of things on a unit basis and some things on an integration basis and the functional basis. You want to do lots of things on a, on a developer desktop, then some of the things in virtual environments, some of the things on test benches, and then do things on or, um, uh, only a few things on, on physical testing. And I think the, the better you get at the capability of testing the real world, in early in the process, the likelier, uh, the, the, the better quality you get out. Um, I, I don't think it will prevent cases like you say that we need to roll back functionality because I, I much prefer that functionalities on the safer side have the false alarm rather than the other way around. 
um, because this reminds me of, of, of a thing when I was at a conference about autonomous driving. Some person said, always remember, ask yourself if you would put your kid in there. What you just develop, would you would you put your kid in there? So I think it will be a long process. Virtual validation, virtual testing is clearly one of the levers, but I guess we will just have to accept that we'd rather be on the safe side than on the just throw it out and ship it innovation side. Are we seeing um, methods that we use in other, like digital twins? Are, are we seeing those kinds of things to, you know, because I can, I have the sensors on the highway. Uh, are, how far away are we from that, where I can actually virtualize using something like a digital twin, the road test without being on the road? Yeah, I think this, this is a, a huge topic. And um, if I look at um, what is done in the autonomous driving space, where you basically uh, not only record thousands of miles of data, you know, as sensors input, and then, you know, use them for the testing of, of your newly created software, but also that you use basically <clears throat> synthetic sensor data, you know, you generate the images for the camera inputs and so on and so on. Um, I think NVIDIA does does, uh, does some talks about this. Um, that's clearly one thing, but also I think the tools and the environments just starting to mature. If, if I see something like digital auto, um, there I can basically write the functionality uh, of, of a component of a car and test it in a, in a fully virtual environment. Um, but things will evolve. And I think the concepts we see from the web and the cloud world, all of them almost apply. But when it comes to physical things, things are, are always more complicated and, and just larger. But I just like to add one other perspective uh, to this. Right. As much as we talk about virtual validation, the very fact Ken, you mentioned that you know your car was able to roll back the feature that you did like, that in itself is a good step forward. Right. Uh, years ago, or let's say even in recent past, once a manufactured car comes out of the factory, you just can't update it anymore. Right. Uh, the value in the car is only depreciating. Uh, but today's car. Uh, by adding these features, uh, the value of the car continues to increase, or at least let's say it does not depreciate. Uh, and let's be honest, I think uh, all manufacturers are also trying to understand what are those best use cases. It differs from geography to geography, it differs from age group of the manif of the you know people driving it, uh, and also the ability to put in the right amount of technology at the right price points. Uh, so I think all manufacturers are learning this, to be provide the best mobility experience. But I think the very fact that you said ability rollout function and possibly also update is indefinitely a positive step and a good learning experience for the manufacturers as well. Now, slightly maybe changing tack, but I, I know we, we, we've spoken a lot about like the, the context in which we're operating. I'm just interested in sort of exploring certain like ten, uh, trends or like innovation themes things that you can uh, you are beginning to see like, like clearly there are a whole bunch of like new languages sort of frameworks and different approaches that have that have come up over the years uh, are you are you beginning to see any of these gaining like the yeah, interest adoption uh, in in the space like or is there a particular uh, favorite choice of language or framework that you know, if you were to build something for uh, as a component in an, SD, in an SDV ecosystem, uh, what would be the default that people tend to go to? Oh, the default for for embedded automotive development is as a programming language C plus um, plus. Then you have CUN and some IP as as the network protocols. Um, you got a, a huge standard um, from the Autosar consortia. That's basically it is the de facto standard, at least for especially German OEMs. Um, and when it comes to the HMI, I think um, especially QT is, is, is the, the thing that is go-to. And I think in all those areas, we see new technologies emerging. People are starting to try out new things and people are starting to adapt new things. Um, what I find personally interesting as a programming language is definitely Rust. Um, we are very involved also um, there. Um, it just eliminates a big amount of of things um, that you can do with C plus plus and and all the mistakes and errors you can make. It just eliminates that, um, and it's on the same level of performance as C plus plus. 
But also, I think what we see is that a lot of people, especially in the autonomous driving field, are um, using uh, ROS, Robot Operating System, that comes more from the robotics and manufacturing world. Um, it just seems that the, the concept of nodes and nodes collaborating together seems to be very good at um, iteratively adding functionality there. And on the HMI space, I yeah, I think people besides Android Automotive play around with Slint, React Native, uh, and things like that. But we always I'm, have I'm to sorry, what's HMI? HMI is human machine interface, and, and, and that's basically the word for my instrument cluster, the stuff that's in front of me, and the infotainment, the stuff that's in the middle. Sorry, I should have explained that. Um, but we have to remember everything needs to be um, safe and certified for being deployed to road vehicles. So adoption will be slow, but definitely things are moving there. Thuram, you're smiling. You want to add to that? No, no, when you said human machine interface, I was only thinking of what my colleague said. It's no longer just the interface, it's probably human machine interactions these days. <laughs> so, uh, you like, is there uh, in the evolution of the space, like clearly in uh, other parts, uh, uh, Michael, your, your reference sort of, uh, you know, it's getting quite similar to, you know, web applications or other parts of uh, software development is, you know, one of the things that we've definitely seen is, uh, the increasing use of like open source or open source by default in many other industries and sectors. Uh, are there, you know, open source framework tools like are like the OEMs or manufacturers sort of contributing or collaborating towards more open standards? Well, the, I, I think there's has been like a huge increase in the last two years. Uh, just to name a few things, um, I think, um, consortias or collaborations like Covisa or Eclipse SDV, there you see lots of movement and also OEMs contributing uh, to open source projects. To be very honest, it's, 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 it's a mixed thing, right? Some of the projects are to try out things, to, to showcase something, right? Or to do some research. Some of the things are meant to, to be put into production. And for some, you also don't know. I mean, uh, re remember when we had this big data wave and and with Hadoop where there was like a zoo of different things. Some of them people forgot about and were discontinued. Some of them became a de facto standard. And I think it will be very similar there. Um, but also, especially when it comes to the standards um, of, of, of data and vehicle data outside of the car, I guess, um, VSS and VISS um, are, are really interesting things um, that are picking up pace right now. At the same time, I would not make a prediction about the role of all, uh, open source software in, in, in for, for embedded cars, uh, embedded uh, software. Um, historically, that has been difficult for, for adoption. People don't like to put, give away their IP. I mean, the, it's the old open source discussion, right? Um, we, we've had that in other industries. <laughs> Yeah, which which also is the standards discussion, right? So, like, um, with apologies to the fact that I know that this is an international audience in the United States, um, one manufacturer that's advertising, "Hey, our car can drive itself," uh, is only on specific highways in California and Nevada, which is two of our fifty states. Um, and so it's like, well, why are they even allowed to advertise in other states? <laughs> uh, and then you have on the other end of the spectrum, you know, Teslas that people think they can. Uh, do their makeup or, or, their, or their organization or whatever as they're driving down the road, which is probably not accurate. Um, I mean, how important are standards and stuff to this to be able to go forth and say, if we're going to interact with a ecosystem like a smart city, or if we're going to interact with sleep management software or that sort of thing, um, are, are those evolving or is it really just a race to Blu-ray versus HD DVD at this point? I, th I think, um, standards in um in the sense of uh, I, I publish an interface or i publish a standard um i think th they are given in the automotive industry I, I i wonder how much they can keep up with the pace of innovation because if we think about other industries i mean show me where people thought really hard came up with a standard and then everyone implemented it i think much more we see People write good services, good software, maybe even open source software, publish it, and then it becomes a de facto standard. Um, I would not be surprised if that happens for, for certain um, aspects and for, for the automotive industry. 
when it comes to regulations, especially when it comes to the putting putting autonomous driving from experiments and research to operations, um, I mean the uh, European Union uh, and, and the German legislation passed a law about this, which is I think the first of its kind in the world, and that seems to be very reasonable. And I guess yes, we need to we need to adapt our laws and rules about doing these things in the world. Um, but I guess we are there definitely on the point where it goes to what the legislation thinks about how will this be in operations, not just how we can develop and test it. I think standards is one aspect, regulations is another. Uh, the way I look at standards is it's going to speed up development, right? In many of these consortia, uh, when different, let's say, OEMs, uh, tier one, hyperscalers, tech companies come together and create frameworks or standards, uh, I think it uh, access it helps in two reasons. One, acts as a force multiplier and avoids duplication of creating the same thing everywhere. Uh, and also gives opportunity for, let's say, newer players to come and use these standards, right? Then developing them themselves or restricting a set of players to only work in a particular uh, tech, pass, uh, tech stack space. Uh, regulations, I think, is going to be extremely important. Uh, as Michael said, he doesn't like the thing smartphone on wheels, and that's where it is. Automotive are very, very different, uh, and why regulations continuously, uh, you know, it's very important to keep track of. And that's something that's not going to be uh, negotiable at all in an automotive space, um, because all said and done, it's extremely safety critical. Uh, and therefore, adhering to these regulations and ensuring whatever technology improvement we do in this space. Uh, we keep safety uh, at its forefront. I know we've covered quite a lot of ground, and clearly this is a you know it's a broad topic with with many many th many many things to deep dive on. Uh, but th th there definitely was one thing I may maybe like Shriram and uh, Michael. I think the one question I did want to ask both of you is: you you've clearly both been like immersed in this in this field and space for quite some time and, and spend some time thinking about it. Like if you were to, if I were to ask you about, like, you know, one thing from your point of view that, that either you think is, you know, over the next few years will become quite key or quite important uh, for anyone looking at like SDV in the space. Yeah, you know, one thing if I would say, uh, it'll be great for our listeners to, to say what what would two experts in the space be talking about? I think uh, what experts would be talking about is not just about moving from A to B. Yeah, uh, mobility is no longer going to be just movement from A to B. It's going to be more uh, than moving from A to B. It's about the experience. It's about the interactions with the ecosystem. Uh, so I think that's what mobility is going to be. Uh, but having said that, I think mobility is going to be, it's a very integral part of being human, right? People definitely want to be moving around. Uh, so in that sense of moving around, how can I create a better experience, a safer experience uh, will be the focus of, you know, people who build cars and who pe and people who build software for cars. <laughs> Michael? I When I finished college, you know, with my computer science, the... The coolest thing in the world for a lot of people was to work for companies like Facebook, Amazon, or Google. I could make an argument that this changed a bit. Um, I think OEMs who embrace the era and the transition into SDV and fully unlock, you know, that what software can do with cars have the potential to take this place. Because for me as a developer, the first time I was sitting in Stuttgart and somebody in Berlin was typing on a screen and the window rolled down in Stuttgart, it was a tiny thing, but it was so rewarding and so much fun. Um, and that, I would think, can be a big thing for, for companies. Awesome. Uh, I mean, thank you, uh, Sriram and Michael, for like sharing your, your insights on, on this topic. Uh, I mean, SDV clearly is something that we all will be keeping an eye on. And... You know, thanks for sharing your your insights and perspectives on this. Uh, thank you, Ken, as well for joining me as a co-host. Yeah, thank you. Thank Mike. you. Uh, thanks for listening to the ThoughtWorks Technology Podcast. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the episode today, uh, and we look forward to you joining us on another episode in the future. Uh, thank you all. <laughs>